So, um, you know, I, I know you certainly want to set yourself apart from the incumbent, but you still got to get past the primary. Of course. What's, what sets you apart from your primary opponent at this stage? Yeah, I think the biggest issue in the primary is really one of readiness. And uh, in the primary, the voters for, in this case, the Democratic Party, have to choose the person who is strongest and most capable of moving forward and then going up against the incumbent to really uh, to showcase the differences in values and beliefs that, uh, that I represent, that we represent, and that I believe are uh, really more consistent with Southern Arizona. What are some of those differences? Well, and meaning those differences with Martha McSally. No, uh, well, at this point, the differences with, with Steele, and then we can move on to McSally. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, <laughs> well, again, I, I, just being able to, to really get the message out there, uh, I think that's something that, that I'm, I have been doing, and I will continue to be able to do uh, better, better than uh, my opponent at this point. And really, I draw on a lot of my experience in terms of listening to, even just last night, listening to my patients and hearing their stories, their frustrations, their struggles, and taking those with me, uh, you know, either to Phoenix when I was representing uh, Tucson in that way, or uh, now, hopefully, to Washington, D.C., and really being able to hear what's going on at that level uh, in the district, you know. Is that, is that the, the main way that your experience diverges from Steele's? Because you, you've both got legislative experience. What we do, and I think that there are differences, you know, looking at the, and it's, these are very complicated legislative records, but, you know, we can, you can look and see that I was able to put through, you know, a dozen different bills and measures that got passed and signed uh, and are now part of, you know, our, our law. Uh, that's, that, that's something that I'm, I'm really proud of, being able to work together, and really this is the other thing, in medicine, uh, we don't ask who's a Republican or who's a Democrat or who's even registered to vote. Nothing, none of that matters. We just fix your heart attack. We fix the problem and, and we come together and you know, we don't convene a committee to decide if we're gonna defibrillate. You know, we, uh, we work together and get problems solved. And that's something that's not happening in DC uh, or in Phoenix in our legislature. And that's something I demonstrated in the legislature that I'm actually very good at doing. Now, in the Arizona legislature, you're in the minority party. Unless there's a massive shakeup in Congress for this election, you'll probably be in the minority party if you, if you get to Congress. Well, anything is possible. So yeah, I don't want to foreclose that possibility, uh, but that is true. So how will that experience of, of working from a, a minority legislative position um, affect you if you do get to Congress? I, honestly, I think that's one of the, one of, another one of uh, my best qualifications, being able to show that record of successfully navigating a two to one, uh, really, you know, not very uh, responsive legislature to many of the, the issues I, I was concerned about, getting bills passed and working together with Republicans and the governor at the time, Governor Brewer, and getting laws passed. Um, in that context, when you're in a tremendously outnumbered situation, that's exactly the kind of experience we need in Washington, D.C., whether you're in the majority or in the minority. Uh, what would be a couple of laws that particularly stand out that you helped get through? I think one of the, one of the really my most favorite, uh, honestly, is uh, Bobby's Law. And that is, uh, I worked with uh, Kate Brophy McGee, a Republican from the Phoenix area. And we, we came to find out this uh, a lady named Bobby Thayer, uh, unfortunately lost her coverage in 2011. We were able to get her help and then address, write a bill to fix the Well Woman Health Check Program to cut red tape and allow women who qualified based on, on need to really get treatment for breast breast and cervical cancer, not just screening, but treatment, which has now actually saved almost 400 women. How did you convince the Republicans to sign on on that one? Well, Kate and I worked really hard on this, and um, it's, a, it's a really, it's a, you know, look, preventable disease, something you can treat uh, relatively inexpensively when it's caught early, you know, and this is something that uh, we just presented to people. We met with the governor's office because we got $8 million a year dedicated to this, um, so $32 million so far. It's helped a lot of people, and it's a good issue, um, something that makes a lot of sense. So my background as a healthcare provider and uh, working with a, a Republican from Paradise Valley, just, you know, people, it just made sense to them, and we were able to get it through. From what we've seen so far, both the Democratic candidates are running against McSally, the incumbent, more than running against each other, it seems. Why is that? Well, it, and, and this happens in a lot of primaries. Like we, we do share a lot of values and beliefs and have advocated for those very publicly, uh, whether it's being, you know, uh, a, 
proponents for labor, proponents for women's health and independent choices in that in that regard, and uh, whether it's you know immigration reform in a comprehensive way, all of these things you know we agree by and large. And where the where the really the biggest issues are, I think, for both of us, um, is the fact that you have an incumbent here that is not paying attention to the beliefs and the values of the district and voting to take away, uh, you know, a right to choose for women or voting against equal pay, which is just unimaginable. Uh, you know, th these are the things that uh, we choose to focus on because, you know, that's the person we have to really be, be targeting, frankly. Uh, let's kind of draw a character sketch of this congressional district. Okay, sure. What, what would your description be of just the, the mindset of, the, the mindset, the philosophy, uh, whatever you like to call it, of congressional district two? I would say fiercely independent. And uh, that is something that uh, I'm really proud of, and uh, I really believe that um, it, it, that's that's a lot of Arizona. But I think, in particular, the second congressional district, literally within uh, a thousand votes of being one third Republican, one third Democrat, and then one third independent registered voters. Uh, so there's that that independence there. Uh, you know, we we elected Jim Colby after he came out as a gay man five more times. He was reelected in this district because that really wasn't an issue. You know, it was his other votes and his, his relationship with the community. So it's a, it's a very, very unique district and uh, frankly the voters um, require a lot of the representatives and they want to see you a lot in the district and know that you know what, what they're going through and, and can actually see to their needs. It's often described as a district that favors moderates of either party. Absolutely right. But this is a time where moderates are getting rare. They are becoming more and more rare, and the the fascinating thing to me about this is um, is uh, you know my my hopefully my GOP opponent, the incumbent, is anything but moderate, and I don't say that just for political expediency. If you look at her record on all of the issues we've talked about, whether it's you know, same-sex marriage or voting to allow gay people to be fired in their in their workplaces of federal contractors or voting for predatory lenders to you know be able to encroach on our nation's bases and vote after vote after vote, uh, 12 votes to allow people with a known terror connection to acquire a weapon with no checks whatsoever, you know, the no-fly, no-buy votes, and six votes to take away Planned Parenthood, which, as you know, if you know, the Planned Parenthood has actually helped decrease the demand for abortion, if anything. So these are not moderate votes, and I think that, that this is another reason why this district needs different leadership. Uh, frequently, the things she says and the way she says them mm -hmm. have become more moderate since she first ran, in terms of how she expresses herself and the things she says. Yeah, I think that, that that's true. I think that that, that for uh, political necessity has definitely occurred, uh, but I, I, it has not occurred with the way she's been voting. So you think that her the, the real Martha McSally is the one who first ran a couple of elections ago? I think that's true, and and we see a really good example uh, back to the uh, an amendment in the Armed Services Committee, which at two in the morning or something on April 29th, Martha McSally was one of the two deciding votes to put the Russell Amendment on the National Defense Reauthorization Act, uh, and that would have reversed President Obama's protections uh, put into place to help uh, make sure that folks who are LGBT are not discriminated against in the workplace. But then at nine in the morning, when it was a bigger issue on the floor of the House, um, she voted to remove the amendment she voted to put it on in the first place. And that is the exact type of um, wishy-washy flip-floppery that is not appropriate for Southern Arizona, and the voters are not going to stand for it. Yeah. Well, I have to honor our time constraints because we're going to have to distill this down into our usual seven seconds of life. Yeah. You know? So anything else you feel like you want to add on all this? Oh, of course, but I think, I mean... Well, I, just <laughs> take, a little, take a little slack here. Go it, ahead. Well, I mean, I, look, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this at this campaign this year, and um, as I've continued to work uh, at my two, my two hospitals in Green Valley and, of course, at Tucson Medical Center, uh, I really derive a lot of strength and motivation from the patients that, that I'm oath-bound to serve, and hearing their stories and, and what they're going through really is what drives me to do this, and I'm passionate about it, and I really enjoy the work. So. Hey. You see a pretty wide range of conditions. Yeah, and we see everyone. Like, even I used to be a doctor at the VA. I was a, I, I, I saw veterans for three years, from 03 to 06, as part of my residency 
training, so I have a lot of experience treating veterans, which is an amazing part of my history I'm very proud of. But uh, now we still see veterans, and sometimes, sadly, they're homeless, living in a wash. We see people from the foothills. We see lots of folks from Cochise County because their hospitals and facilities often lack the type of specialization. So they fly in. There are a lot of patients come in from Benson, Wilcox, uh, Sierra Vista. Uh, Douglas no longer has a hospital, unfortunately. Um, that closed last year, as you know. Uh, so, you know, but, but people come in from Cochise County as well. And then you'll see the 19-year-olds with an appendicitis who are you know, uninsured college students. So all walks of life, pretty much every condition, and that really gives that a, a great snapshot of the entire community and, who, and, and the struggles and, and problems facing everyone.